All right, in module two, we talk about localization for autonomous vehicles. Uh, for vehicles, one of the most important tasks is to localize itself so that it, in real time it knows exactly where it is. Uh, and then when human beings drive cars, we usually use uh, GPS for localization. Uh, for cars, uh, we can start with that. Uh, we can start with GPS and see how GPS can help uh, autonomous vehicles localize themselves. All right, let's look at GPS. Uh, the technology we use is called GNSS, uh, Global Navigation uh, Systems. Uh, and then we can combine this GNSS system with the INS system, which is the Inertial uh, Navigation System as well. And we will explain why later in the slides. But we look at uh, GPS first. Uh, GPS is one part of the GNSS system. And then the GNSS consists of any uh, several other satellite systems, including the Galileo from Europe and uh, the Beidou from China and so on. Um, and GPS is the system used by US, uh, so we start with that. Uh, for GPS, in, in practical uses, uh, when you have a cell phone, you, you have a GPS module there to receive GPS signal. And then uh, in practice, we have measured that uh, with a, a normal GPS module, you can uh, uh, localize yourself within a five meter radius and so on. Um, so it provides kind of uh, accurate enough uh, localization uh, position for human drivers to localize themselves. But for cars, that's uh, not enough because for autonomous vehicles, it knows exactly which lane it is in. So the GPS accuracy is not enough for that purpose. But there are several other uh, versions, uh, more expensive versions of uh, GPS. The first one is RTK or the real-time kinematics. Uh, the RTK GPS uh, it works in the following way. So. Um, the normal GPS uh, is not accurate enough because of different air sources which we show on the slide uh, including the satellite clocks, orbit errors, uh, atmospheric uh, delays, receiver noise and so on. Um, and then when we have real-time kinematics, uh, the way it works is that they deploy base stations on the ground such that both the base station and the vehicle receive a GPS signal. And then since the base station knows exactly where it is on Earth, uh, it can calculate the GPS error at real time. And then it will broadcast that error uh, to the moving vehicles. And then when the vehicles receive two messages, one from the, the satellites, one from the base station, and then they do the error correction to derive its accurate location. And then using RTK technology, you can pretty much achieve centimeter accuracy. But the problem with RTK is that you have to deploy these base stations. Each one will only cover a few miles of radius. Um, so if you want to cover the whole United States, you need to deploy thousands or even tens of thousands of these base stations, which makes it very expensive. Uh, but the, the good thing about it is that it does provide very accurate localization. And then if we go to next generation of uh, GNSS systems, we have this called uh, Precision Point Positioning or PPP kind of GPS. How it works is that it has uh, several reference stations on the ground across different continents. And then these uh, reference stations receive very accurate GPS signals and then they can calculate the air. And then they broadcast the air correction through the internet. Uh, in this way, you only have to uh, have several uh, reference stations instead of many, many base stations on the ground. Uh, then with this technology, you don't have to deploy your own base station, but you can still achieve uh, centimeter level accuracy. Um, the problem today with this technology is that it takes a long time to warm up, uh, say 30 minutes before you can achieve uh, convergence. Uh, what we call convergence is the, the amount of time to achieve the highest level of accuracy. So it's still not quite ready yet, but I expect in the next few years the PPP technology would be uh, the standard technology for autonomous vehicle localization. And then uh, you say, hey, that's very good. You can achieve centimeter accuracy already. Um, let's use it. But that, that may not be enough because uh, for two things. Uh, the first thing is for GNSS systems, uh, you should provide uh, one update per second or even uh, at most 10 updates per second. So it's not very frequent. Uh, if you're driving the car at a very fast speed, uh, then you might want very frequent update. Um, uh, although it's very accurate, it does not provide very frequent update. Uh, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that in some areas, such as in a tunnel, you don't have GNSS signal. And uh, then for uh, some, some amount of time, you, you, you are not able to localize the car. Uh, then we have a solution around this problem. We combine the GNSS and the initial measurement units, uh, the INS system. 
for the inertial system, it actually measures the accelerometer, uh, which measures the, the acceleration of the car uh, on, on the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. And then the drive scope uh, measures the, the velocity, angular velocity. So if you integrate these numbers, you can actually get a location update. Uh, but the problem with INS system is very fast, it provides one thousand updates per second but it's not very accurate since it has to do two times of integration in order to derive the location so how about we combine the two such that uh, we use the INS system for very fast update and then we use the GPS or GNSS system for very accurate updates if we somehow combine the two we get a system that provides very fast update but at the same time it's very accurate so that's what we have here we use uh, something the mathematical tool that's called common filter that combines GNSS signal and the INSS signal to derive very accurate and very fast location updates and so that's the technology about GNSS and INS the next thing they will say hey maybe that's not enough in some areas we have very long turnovers, and then we also need the vehicle to be very robust, very reliable, so that we need multiple mechanisms to do localization. Uh, so another standard way to do localization is to use the LIDAR or the laser detection and ranger, uh, ranging uh, device and the HD map, the high definition map together to do localization. So let's uh, take a look at that as well. For LIDAR, um, we, we, on the slide we show a LIDAR device, it, it works in the following ways. Uh, it has two parts. The first part is the laser emitter, such that it emits a light uh, to the space, and then at the bottom of it, there's a laser receiver, such that it receives the reflection of light back. What it captures is the 3D environment. Uh, the points in this environment are all in 3D. It has an X, it has a Y, and it has a depth in Z direction. Uh, with this accurate direction, you can build a very accurate 3D map around your environment. Um, and then for each point you measure in space, you have something called the reflectivity. Uh, different materials would have different reflectivity. So we can use the reflectivity value to identify a point in space. And then when we do point matching, uh, then we can use uh, reflectivity values. Then HD map. HD map is basically a map built with this kind of detailed 3D information, which we will go over uh, in more details in the next slides. But the basic mechanism is that we use the current LiDAR scan against uh, the HD maps uh, to do a match and so that we can find out exactly where we are in the HD map. And then the mathematical tool we use for this purpose is called particle filters. Okay, so what exactly is the HD map? It's actually uh, a layered map of the environment. At the bottom of it, uh, it's a grid kind of map. Uh, it's, the resolution of it can be a very fine grain to be 5 cm by 5 cm. Uh, in each grid, you have the reflectivity of that point in space, uh, such that when you have a LiDAR scan, you can match your scan against what's on the map so that you can uh, kind of uh, deduce where exactly you are. Uh, and then, so that's the foundation layer. You have this reflectivity grid. On top of it, you put uh, more information. Uh, for example, you put the road reference line so that with this reference line, you know where your main road is. And then, but that's not accurate enough. Uh, then you add the next layer, it's lane information. So you can uh, identify which lane on the highway you are on currently. And then on top of that, you can add semantic information such as the speed limits and then the traffic sign and so on. And that's why the map is uh, so-called high definition. And then it has three requirements. First, it, since it's very high definition, it has to be very fresh. Uh, that means that if you are a map collecting vehicle, then you need to go around the route uh, once every, uh, for, for example, a week. Uh, and then you have to be very precise. The, the precision is provided by um, the LiDAR device so that you can collect very precise point in space. And then the last requirement is how do you integrate this map with the client system? Due to these requirements, making a high definition map is very expensive. And then that we will discuss more later. The next way to localize a vehicle is to use what we call the visual autometry. Uh, what it means is you just use the camera you have on board uh, to localize a vehicle. The standard way of doing it is to use stereo camera so that you have the left camera and the right camera and they are perfectly aligned such that for every frame you actually have the depth information uh, of the space just like the LiDAR can scan uh, the depth information. And then using the depth information, the next stage is how do you match the feature points or the, the 3D points from the previous frame with the current frame. 
if you can match your point from previous frame to current frame, then you can deduce how much distance you have traveled uh, since the last frame. And that's how we get localization results uh, using this technology. And there's some variation of visual autometry. Uh, the standard way is to do stereo visual autometry. But you can also do it with only one camera. That's called the mono visual autometry. And then uh, for the same reason, uh, for camera, you can get about 30 to 60 frames updates per second. But if you need more than that, you can do this uh, visual inertial automatic, meaning that we combine the visual information and the INS information to provide accurate and uh, uh, very frequent updates. So there are three flavors of visual automatic. The last one, uh, and it's very uh, fundamental requirement for autonomous vehicle is the real automatic. Uh, as the vehicle is moving on the road, uh, the wheels is rotating, uh, and then this uh, wheel, the rotating wheel, will re uh, feed, give you information feedback about how much distance uh, the vehicle has traveled based on the wheel information. So we call that wheel autometry. And again, there are different flavors. Uh, depends on your chassis design. There are different flavors of wheel autometry, including the Ackerman steering. That's the most popular for uh, autonomous vehicles. The differential drive, and then there's a tricycle uh, drive, and so on. So that's um, real autometry. And that's the end of this module. And then in the next module, we will cover more details about uh, localization.